after spending the last couple months catching up on movies, I finally am ready to rank every movie I saw that came out in 2020 from the worst to the best. The reason that this video is so late is because every year there's always a handful of movies that I would have liked to have seen but didn't get a chance to and therefore couldn't put on my list. So for this past year, especially with so many movies being released on VOD and through streaming services, I just decided to wait a few months and catch up on movies before doing my ranking. I managed to see 43 movies that came out in 2020, which is a pretty good number considering how few movies came out this past year. That being said, there are, as always, a few movies that I would have liked to have seen but did not get the chance. Here they are. As always, this is just my opinion. My list is not objectively correct. Let me know in the comments below what were y'all's favorite movies of 2020. Without further ado, let's get started. In last place is gonna be The Call of the Wild. The Call of the Wild was a dumbed down PG-ified version of the iconic novel. It stays true to the broad strokes of the novel's story, but makes a lot of changes to make it more accessible. The CGI dogs in the movie don't feel real and just have no tangibility to them. On the positive side, Harrison Ford's actually pretty good in this movie. He's better here than he's been in a long time. Number 42, I'm thinking of ending things. Charlie Kaufman writes and directs a semi-avant-garde movie about a young woman going to meet her boyfriend's parents. The acting in this movie is outstanding, especially from Tony Collette and David Thewlis. However, the film leans a little too heavily into its experimental sides for my taste and ends up feeling a little bit shallow. Tremor Shrieker Island, which appears to be the last Tremors movie is pretty disappointing, honestly. While I didn't expect much from a movie about giant carnivorous worms, the writing, direction, acting, and CGI are all pretty horrible here. At least the previous Tremors movie, especially those first couple, had a sense of fun about them and it felt like they actually put effort into making them. Everything in this movie just feels lazy. Peninsula fails to live up to its predecessor in every way possible. The characters are unlikable, there's no suspense, the tone feels off, and the CGI is awful. The same director of one of the greatest Korean movies of all time came back to make a lackluster sequel that feels like a sci-fi channel original. DC's direct-to-DVD Superman Red Sun movie is good enough. The voice acting, animation, and direction all work well enough. However, like most animated DC movies, it follows the comic book panel by panel and therefore doesn't feel super confident in itself or its ideas. The first big budget Scooby-Doo movie in a long time is pretty mediocre. The voice acting is fine, the animation is fine, the direction and writing are fine. The plot focuses way too much on other Hanna-Barbera characters and not enough on Scooby-Doo characters. The Devil All the Time is a Netflix original period dramedy about religion that ends up being okay. The acting is really good and the direction is really good, but the movie is so slow paced that it feels confused as to where it's going. There are way too many side plots and characters. It feels like they squashed a several hundred page book into a two hour movie and didn't know what exactly to cut. Number 36, Hubie Halloween. Adam Sandler's goofy Halloween movie is exactly what you'd expect. Adam Sandler plays a dork with a big heart, Julie Bowen is his love interest, and Steve Buscemi is a villain of sorts. The jokes are fine, Hubie's arc is fine, and it's just fun to have a good, stupid Adam Sandler movie in the middle of a pandemic. Number 35, We Can Be Heroes. Robert Rodriguez's weird, trippy, low-budget style returns for a decent enough kids movie. The acting is okay, the story is okay, and the CGI is characteristically awful. It's just a mediocre enough superhero kids movie. The Gentleman is a pretty solid return to the British crime genre for Guy Ritchie. The cast works, the dark humor is funny, and Ritchie's manic, energetic directing and writing style is very fun. However, the plot gets a little bit too convoluted toward the end to the point where it's actually kind of confusing. Phineas and Ferb the movie Candace Against the Universe provided a lot of nostalgia for one of my favorite childhood TV shows, but falls a little bit short of its predecessor. Fox's X-Men universe, a 20-year-old franchise, comes to a pretty mediocre end in The New Mutants. The characters and actors work for the most part, Anya Taylor-Joy's magic being the standout. However, the plotline is very cliche and formulaic. The villain of this movie is the most generic um, villain in a haunted asylum movie imaginable. The tone feels consistent for the most part, but I wish it had leaned more into the horror side of things. 
Plus, the ending where the main character pets a giant CGI bear made me laugh more than anything else. The Social Dilemma is a very well-made documentary about the dangers of social media. It's very insightful and captivating and presents a lot of information about how social media was created and why it's so destructive. However, the narrative segments in the movie are just not as good as the documentary segments. They're directed really awkwardly and the acting feels off. Number 30, Enola Holmes. Millie Bobby Brown stars as Sherlock Holmes' younger sister. She leads the movie well, and the movie crafts an interesting mystery in typical Sherlock Holmes fashion. That being said, the tone of the movie does feel a little bit off. When you have a teenage girl in the 1800s doing jujitsu, that's bound to happen. Bringing us into the 20s is Horse Girl. Alison Brie stars in a Donnie Darko meets Black Beauty style psychedelic trip. The movie tries to be ambiguous and open to interpretation, but really comes off kind of shallow. Some people may find it original and intriguing, but it fell kind of flat for me. At number 28 is Wonder Woman 1984. While Gal Gadot and Chris Pine still have great chemistry and Pedro Pascal is having the time of his life, the lore and world building that this movie introduces is honestly really, really strange and really, really hurts the third act. I appreciate the Richard Donner-esque shooting style, but the movie script needed a lot of improvement. Number 27, Bill and Ted Face the Music. It is so refreshing to have a blast of optimism in a time when the state of the world seems so bleak. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter still have great chemistry, as do Samara Weaving and Bridget Lundy Payne. The directing and writing are just as sharp as they were in the previous two movies, and the tone is perfect. Number 26, Birds of Prey. I'm gonna call it Birds of Prey because when I saw the movie, that's what it was called. It's gone through several title changes since then, but um, I'm just gonna call it Birds of Prey. DC's first female team-up movie was pretty divisive, but I was pretty positive on it. Margot Robbie is great again as Harley Quinn, Ewan McGregor is having a blast as Black Mask, and the rest of the cast works really well together. While I understand the criticisms that this movie's message wasn't really very well communicated, I don't really think it was supposed to be a message-driven movie. I think you were supposed to enjoy the aesthetic and tone and style more so than any sort of theme or message. No Bad Land features some amazing direction from Chloe Zhao and a fantastic performance from Francis McDormand, but really should have been a documentary. Mank perfectly captures the aesthetic and tone of a 1940s movie as well as the film industry at the time. However, it will alienate those who are not really familiar with the real-life people and incidents that inspired Citizen Kane, as well as all the controversy behind it. It also is not for people who don't like a strong sense of correlation or causation between the scenes of a movie. Number 23, The Father. I know this goes without saying, but Anthony Hopkins' performance in this movie is amazing. Of course it is, it's Anthony Hopkins. The other performances, particularly Olivia Colman and Olivia Williams, are also good. I really, really liked the beginning of this movie. The middle got a little repetitive, but the ending absolutely destroyed me. I'll leave it at that. Extraction very may well end up being the movie that revives the mid-budget action movie genre. Chris Hemsworth leads the movie pretty well. He has really good chemistry with the actor that plays the kid, as well as just about every other actor in the movie. The actor that plays the main bad guy also does a really good job. Of course, the action is phenomenal. It's shot from wide angles, so you can always see what's going on, and the camera is constantly moving around, but not done in a way that descends into shaky cam territory, but in a way that shows off the choreography. Words on the Bathroom Walls is exactly what you want from a feel-good teen dramedy with a lot of heart and a good message. Bringing us into the top 20 is Promising Young Woman. I really enjoyed the tone and aesthetic of Promising Young Woman. Being ever so slightly heightened is a hard tone to capture, much less maintain. However, there is no amount of nuance or subtlety in how this film delivers its message. It's every guy's worst nightmare getting accused like that. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? It's Spike Lee levels of heavy-handed and preachy. Amazon Prime Video delivers a very intense and well-made thriller with 7,500. Joseph Gordon-Levitt leads the movie well, and the actor who plays the lead hijacker handles his scenes with nuance. The movie is suspenseful, engaging, and manages to pull off a sense of realism very well. Onward is by no means Pixar's strongest effort, but I still thought it got more hate than it deserved. The characters, themes, and storyline all tie together nicely while still having that sense of fun that Pixar is known for. I've heard some criticisms of the world building and that the concept of the movie does not feel fully realized, but 
I think they did the best they could with a two hour movie. Number 17, The Five Bloods. Spike Lee's Vietnam War movie deserves a review of its own, but for right now, I'll just summarize my thoughts. The performances, especially Delroy Lindo, are fantastic, and Spike Lee is surprisingly good at shooting action. However, his heavy-handed preachy nature does more harm than good. The movie could be a complex thought piece about what a real-life group of people had to go through, but instead feels more like a sermon that brings up sins of the past instead of trying to move on. Minari provides a good look at Korean-American life in the 1960s and features some excellent performances, especially from Steven Yun and Ya Jung Yoon. However, the movie falls into a lot of prestige movie cliches and has some tonal issues. Number 15, The Trial of the Chicago 7. Aaron Sorkin's fast-paced but efficient script does a good job telling the story of eight protesters on trial. The film manages to balance numerous characters and give them all a distinct personality and ideology. The cast is great, with each actor having a distinct energy that adds to his or her character. Number 14, The Old Guard. Charlize Theron stars in a fantasy action movie about immortal warriors. The cast has really good chemistry, the action is really well shot, and the plot works reasonably well. Where the movie falters is its lore. There are some holes in the world building that sequels could theoretically fix, but are still very prevalent in this movie. Judas and the Black Messiah is a suspenseful thriller carried by two powerhouse performances. However, like Minari before it, it does fall into a lot of prestige movie cliches. Number 12, The Vast of Night. This movie is an excellent tribute to 1950s sci-fi and perfectly captures the aesthetic it's going for. The acting, writing, and directing all work really well, but the ending falls a little bit flat. Number 11, The Hunt. Blumhouse's The Most Dangerous Game-inspired action thriller manages to be heavy-handed, but in a way that works. The action is really fun, the comedy works, and the messaging works because it can apply to any group of people. I'll admit I wish that the characters were a bit more fleshed out, but the actors are having a lot of fun, and they each manage to poke fun at their respective stereotypes while maintaining a degree of legitimacy. Number 10, Love and Monsters. Dylan O'Brien and Jessica Henwick star in a fantasy action comedy about a world overrun by monsters. This movie reminds me of the YA era, but in a good way. It's fun, action-packed, and entertaining, but doesn't take itself too seriously and isn't afraid to poke fun at its ridiculous premise. Number 9, Bad Education. HBO Max's biographical dramedy takes a look at how people are never truly what they seem. Hugh Jackman and Allison Janney play characters who are sympathetic but also very self-centered. They make the audience like them to an extent while at the same time never condoning their actions. I wish that the movie had focused a little more on the journalism side of things instead of on Jackman and Janie's personal lives, but the movie still works as a cautionary tale regarding how actions always have consequences. Number 8, Palm Springs. This rom-com subverts the cliches of the time loop movie while also putting a clever spin on a familiar formula. Andy Samberg and Kristen Milioti have great chemistry and they both have strong character arcs. The humor works, the characters are fun, and the movie dodges and pokes fun at a lot of time loop movie tropes. Number 7, Another Round. Thomas Vinterberg offers an interesting deconstruction and exploration of alcohol culture backed by a strong performance from Mads Mikkelsen. The movie does lack a little bit in its structure. It is a little bit hard to follow at times, but the ending scene makes it all worth it. Number 6, Sound of Metal. Sound of Metal is a thought-provoking look at how people cope with trauma and the ways in which people try to fill the holes in their lives. The acting, sound mixing, direction, and writing all come together to create my favorite Best Picture nominee. Number 5, Tenet. Christopher Nolan's weird, bendy, sci-fi action espionage thriller was confusing to say the least, but I loved it. I like the cast, the action is great, and Ludwig Göransson's score is amazing. However, the sound design definitely could have used some improvement, and I feel like the main character, the protagonist... I'm the protagonist of this operation. I'm the protagonist. You are a protagonist. Needed more fleshing out. Also, this movie is definitely one to watch more than once. 
It starts giving you information in literally the first scene of the movie and doesn't stop until the credits roll. Number 4, The Way Back. Ben Affleck gives probably his best performance yet as a man struggling with alcoholism given a second chance. While the first half of this movie follows the sports movie template very closely, the second half dives deeper into the issue of substance abuse and what it can do to a person's mental state. While I'll admit that I wish the team that he's coaching was fleshed out a little bit more, the movie still communicates its message very clearly, bringing us into the top three, The Invisible Man. Leo Wannell's psychological horror movie is one of Blumhouse's best. It creates an eerie atmosphere and genuine suspense using very little. Elizabeth Moss gives probably her best performance yet, and the allegory for PTSD caused by domestic abuse is communicated very clearly. Our runner-up is Soul. Soul lives up to Pixar's reputation of making thought-provoking, thematically rich movies that are also very entertaining. It combines visceral animation, fantastic world-building, relatable characters, and philosophical undertones to create yet another Pixar masterpiece. This year had no shortage of good, bad, great movies, and I really, really liked a lot of them. On a different day of the week, just about any of them could be number one, but I think that my favorite movie of this past year was The King of Staten Island. Judd Apatow's newest dramedy was a lot better than I expected. Pete Davidson, Marissa Tomei, and Bill Burr all give great performances that play off one another really well. The main character's character arc works really well, and the movie's messaging is the perfect amount of subtle. Overall, it proves that Judd Apatow is much more than just obnoxious humor and sex jokes. So that's it, that's my ranking. What do you guys think about my ranking? Do you agree, do you disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Are there any movies from this past year that you guys think I missed out on, ones that I didn't mention? Because there were so many movies on this list, I only talked about each one briefly. If you want to hear a more thorough evaluation of any movie on this list, let me know in the comments below and I'll see if I could do a full length review. If you want to see more movie ranking videos, check out this playlist. As always, thank you guys very much for watching. Be sure to subscribe. Bye.